A reading for the book of Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlines wait for his teaching. Thus saith Yahweh the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes of that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am Yahweh. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus became aware of the plot to kill him, he departed. Many crowds followed him, and he cured all of them, and he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not wrangle or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick until he brings justice to victory, and his name the Gentiles will hope. The Gospel of Christ. The book of the prophet Isaiah is probably the most beloved of the prophetic books in the Hebrew Bible by Christian readers and Christian scholars and Christian thinkers. It's one of the five major prophets in the Hebrew Bible. They're called the major prophets because they have the longest books compared to the 12 minor prophets with the short books. And what we see in the book of Isaiah is this perception that Isaiah the prophet is saying something largely about the arrival of Jesus the Messiah 700 years beforehand. This is part of the reason it's so well loved. We also see in the letters in the New Testament that are attributed to the Apostle Paul that out of the 37 times that he quotes the prophets from the Old Testament, fully 27 of those quotes come from Isaiah leaving only 10 quotes for the remaining 14 prophets in the Hebrew Bible. So the book of Isaiah is of immense importance in the Christian tradition, and it stems around this connection with the arrival and birth of Jesus and prophecies understood relating to him. But we have to ask ourselves the question, how exactly does that work? After all, the nature of prophecy in the Hebrew Bible is different from what we typically associate with the prophet Isaiah in the first place. So let's go ahead and explore that a bit this morning, because it's important for us to get this sorted if we want to be able to see indeed how the Hebrew Bible is indeed relevant to us, how it connects with Jesus, and how it connects with us even further. And so we begin by thinking of Isaiah the man himself. Isaiah the prophet lived in the latter part of the 8th century BCE, so from about 750 BCE to 700. And those of you that have been paying attention for the past few weeks will go, hey, wait a minute, 722 BC is right in the middle of that, and you would be right. And the reason that's significant is because that's the year that the Assyrian Empire conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And what we find in the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah is that Isaiah was saying to Israel, 
you got to pay attention to what Yahweh is telling you to do, because if you don't, you are going to find yourself in dire straits. Assyria is going to come and do you harm. And sure enough, in 722 BCE, that's exactly what happened. And then after that, Isaiah continues to speak now to the southern kingdom of Judah and is saying to them, guys, take a lesson from the northern kingdom. Don't think that just because you've got Jerusalem in your territory that somehow you're something special. If you don't pay attention and obey as Yahweh says we're supposed to, you too will have harm come upon you. And Isaiah comes to the end of his life around 700 BCE. But then something interesting happens. In chapter 40 and following for the book, up to chapter 66, by the way, sometimes people notice that Isaiah has 66 chapters. There are 66 books in the Bible. What is that saying? Well, actually, it's not saying anything because there were no chapters when Isaiah was first written. And so it's actually quite arbitrary that they divided it up into 66 chapters. It could have been 33 chapters. They just would have been longer, right? So don't read anything into that. But what does happen when you're reading Isaiah, you get to chapter 40, and you then find immediately that the tone of the book changes. Because the first 39 chapters have been all about warning and impending judgment. Be aware that this bad thing can happen. Israel has been defeated. Judah, watch out. It could be your turn next. And all of this kind of doom and gloom kind of message. But then in chapter 40, we get these words, comfort, oh, comfort my people, says the Lord. Tell Jerusalem that her price has been paid. Her penalty has been fulfilled. She has received from the Lord twice of what was supposed to happen and everything is going to be made new again. And as you continue to read in those chapters, you discover that what's being talked about here is that Israel, who has been in exile, is going to be able to be restored back to their promised land. They're going to be able to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the name of Cyrus, the king of Persia, shows up right away in this part of the book. The problem here is that from chapter 39 to chapter 40, we've skipped over 160 years of history. We've gone from 700 BCE to 540 BCE when the Persian Empire had overrun the Babylonian Empire. And what happened in this in-between part is the Babylonians had defeated the Assyrians, and then in 586 BCE, the Babylonians conquered Judah because they weren't paying attention to uh, Isaiah and other prophets. And then they've been taken away in exile for decades, and now suddenly Babylon has been defeated, and this is what we're talking about. And so when people read that, in Christian tradition, it said that Isaiah was responsible for the entire book. They're thinking, oh my goodness, Isaiah, living 160 years before these events, was able to see into the future and be able to describe what was going to happen to Judah, that there would be a restoration from exile. And he was even able to name Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, long before Persia was even a concern on the world stage. This is amazing. His prophetic ability is incredible. He must be really in touch with God. And then as you continue reading the book of Isaiah, you get to the last 10 chapters, 56 to 66, and you find out that what's being spoken of there is another 100 years removed from what chapter 40 was about. And it's talking about Israel now having been restored and dealing with issues related to getting temple worship started up again and what it is to be living in the promised land again. And it's curious how different that is as well. In 1100 CE, in the Middle Ages, a Jewish scholar, Abraham Ibn Ezra, made the observation that really there's no way to conclude that Isaiah the prophet, the man, wrote the entire book of Isaiah. That instead, from chapter 40 and onward, it was written by another author, perhaps a few authors, holding on to this thematic stream that Isaiah had started, but using his name and continuing to write to encourage the people of Israel, in particular, to continue to remain faithful to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so when these events that were being written in chapter 40 were occurring, these things were being written down either just shortly before they happened or while they were happening or shortly after they had happened. And then again, the events 100 years later were being recorded concurrent with when they were happening. In the late 1700s, so just 250 years ago, if my math is correct, 
Uh, There were two Christian um, scholars who agreed with Abraham Ibn Ezra and said, yes, it's true. This is the way it is. Isaiah was not written by one man, but by at least two and perhaps even three. And so the first 39 chapters are often referred to as proto-Isaiah or first Isaiah. And then the second part of the book is written, uh, is called deutero-Isaiah or second Isaiah. And sometimes the last 10 chapters are called um, third Isaiah. We have this tradition started by the prophet, but continued on by others as these events were taking place. Now, when that observation is made, for some people, it causes some pushback. The thought is, well, wait a minute, hold it though. Like, if you're saying that Isaiah actually didn't see all of this in the future and see it prophetically, then then, then what do we do with all the prophecies about Jesus that are contained in the book of Isaiah? Like, what happens to that? because he's prophesying the Messiah and and Isaiah 53. Isn't that really important? Isn't that about Jesus? And and it's like, I, I, I get the concern and let's just hold on for a sec. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. But we still have to remember that the Hebrew Bible was written by ancient Israelites in Israel hundreds of years before Jesus showed up. And we have to understand the nature of how the prophets worked in the Hebrew Bible to get how we connect these dots. So the way it works, prophets in the Hebrew Bible were primarily concerned with foretelling what God wanted the people to know, rather than foretelling the future. So they would proclaim what it is that God would want the leaders and the people of Israel to know. What did God want them to know? It was already written down in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And so the prophet would be reading the Torah and looking around and seeing there's a disconnect here with what I'm seeing and what was written. And so they would turn to the king and say, king, this is what kind of king you're supposed to be. Thus says the Lord, this is how it is you're supposed to rule. This is what you're supposed to have your people do. The prophet would turn to the people and say, guys, why are you worshiping other gods? The Torah says that the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, is the only one. Why are you worshiping other gods? Cut it out, will you? Stop it. Something bad is going to happen. Which is what leads to what part of the prophetic ministry did have a predictive nature. Anytime the prophets would predict that something would happen, it had an initial fulfillment that happened relatively quickly after they pronounced those words. And I think the maximum length of time that we could see between when a prophet would predict something and it would happen would be within 20 years. It was actually very, very soon. To give you an idea of what these are like, consider that the prophet, again, is simply referring to the Hebrew Bible, uh, sorry, referring to the Torah, and if there is a warning there, if Israel, you do not do this, then this is going to happen to you. You are going to be overrun and defeated. Well, the prophet, speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel, for example, would say, look, guys, if you're not paying attention to Yahweh, the Assyrians are going to overrun you. Well, why would he highlight the Assyrians? Well, because the Assyrians were the empire that was conquering everybody, and it makes sense that they would be the main threat. Later on, when the warning is given to Judah, Babylon is now on the rise. And so the prediction is not some kind of special knowledge that they are given directly that enables them to know something nobody could possibly know, but it's putting the pieces together and saying, this is what's going to happen. Let me give you an example of such prophecy as I speak prophetically to you this morning. If you open your fridge, in the back of your fridge, you find something fuzzy, and you eat it, you will get sick. Let me spell that out even more. If thou shouldst put something in your fridge today, and upon waiting three weeks, and open said fridge and find fuzziness growing within, and if you were to consume such object, I would predict that within a week thou shalt be sick. And I would likely be correct, because it follows that if this happens and this happens and this happens, this will be the result. I don't use that silly illustration to minimize the role of the Hebrew prophets, but to help us understand how prophecy worked. And so as Isaiah was saying what he was saying, this is how people were to take it, and this is how they did take it. There was no idea as he was writing his stuff that he was predicting something seven centuries in the future that wouldn't even have been part of the picture because that wasn't the nature of how the prophets worked. But... 
we have to figure out how this does connect, because this is what happens in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, and here in the Gospel reading, the Gospel of Matthew makes a connection, okay? We're still getting there. We're still getting there. One of the significant things about chapter 40 and onward in the book of Isaiah is that in several places, the book refers to the servant of God or the servant of Yahweh. This comes up all over the place through these chapters. And there are four passages in particular, four little poetic excerpts that are referred to as the servant songs that are saying something about this servant. So naturally the question comes, who is the servant of the Lord? Well, in some places, it's very clear that the servant is Israel herself, the people of God. It will say, this is my servant, Israel. And it'll go on and talk about what the servant experiences. In other places, the servant is none other than Isaiah, the one who is writing the book. And Isaiah is the servant of God who is calling forth uh, for a response from the people of Israel. We also find and this is the case in Isaiah 42, which is what we read today, that Cyrus the Great of Persia is the servant of God. We'll come back to that in a quick second. The fourth option for the servant is this future suffering servant, which is where we get more traction for Jesus. But we're not going to have time to delve well into that. But let me just still get you on the right track as we get moving into this. Isaiah 42, which we heard today, is about Cyrus, the king of Persia. And what we find, not only do we hear these words, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, how do we know that this is Cyrus? Well, because as this continues in this theme, we get to the end of 44 and the beginning of 45, and it says this, thus says Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. And he goes on to describe what Cyrus is going to do. By the way, in this particular verse, thus says Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus, the word anointed there in Hebrew is the word Mashiach, which is what we get the word Messiah from, because Messiah means anointed one. And so at this time, Cyrus is the anointed one. Cyrus is a Messiah of Yahweh. Well, why does Cyrus get this title? Why is Cyrus referred to this at all? Well, what we find is Cyrus the Great of Persia, Cyrus II, had a policy for running the empire that was completely unlike anybody else. When the Assyrians were conquering nations, they would just completely obliterate them altogether like they did with the northern kingdom of Israel. When Babylon overran the Assyrian Empire, their approach was to take the best and brightest from the countries they conquered and take them to Babylon, and, and in that way they would subsume these other countries into Babylonian culture, and they were torn out of their homeland, like happened to the southern kingdom of Judah when Jerusalem was defeated by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. But Cyrus the Great of Persia did it differently. And his thought was, in order to manage best the 127 provinces of his sprawling empire, that it would be better if all of the people in his empire were, you know, happy and were pleased about their lot in life. And so while remaining under the umbrella of the Persian empire, Cyrus's policy was to allow them to go back to their homeland and speak their own language and follow their own religious practices, and worship in the way that they wanted to worship. Assyria just eliminated their religions. Babylon wanted them instead to bow down and worship the Babylonian gods. But here Cyrus the Great is saying, no, go back to your homelands and worship your own gods and, and follow the ways in which that you would follow. This is something that could be perceived as healing to the nations. The nations that had been defeated are now being restored. And in fact, when Cyrus, the king of Persia, conquered the Babylonians and now had Babylon under his purview, he allowed the Babylonians to return to their ways, so that the Babylonians even referred to Cyrus as the liberator. We know about these policies in an archaeological discovery called the Cyrus Cylinder, a clay 
cylinder that is written in Akkadian script talking about how Cyrus defeated the Babylonians and it outlines his policy of running his empire. Some people call this the first and most ancient example we have of a declaration of human rights. Um, that's a little anachronistic. People never talked like that back then. But because of his openness to people being restored to what they were, he was seen in a much more positive light. And so in Isaiah 42, when we read that the servant whom Yahweh upholds, my chosen in whom I delight, he will bring forth justice to the nations, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. And this is exactly how Israel was feeling while they were in exile under Babylon. We don't have our temple, we don't have our capital city, we don't have our own religion anymore. It's like we're, there's, we're barely a flicker of what we once were, and Cyrus enables them to go back. In fact, over the course of about 100 years, in four waves, Israelites are allowed to return to Jerusalem, and it wasn't that Cyrus required them to pay him for the privilege. He underwrote the expenses for Israel to be restored, to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and reestablish themselves as the people of God observing all of the Torah. No wonder Cyrus the Great was perceived as a servant of the Lord. No wonder Cyrus the Great was perceived as one anointed by the Spirit of God to do such a wonderful thing for the people of Israel. And we can understand why then the prophet Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah, was written in such a way. But now that brings us to the gospel. Because in Matthew chapter 12, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew says that when Jesus experienced a particular episode in his life, here what had happened was there was a man with a withered hand, and he healed that man's withered hand, but it was a Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that, and the Pharisees were all upset, and so they were plotting to figure out how to take Jesus' life. Once he had learned about that plot against his life, which is what the Gospel reading picks us up on here, he decides to leave, and a bunch of people come with him. And of all the people that are following him, Jesus looks at them and says, you know what, I don't care if it's the Sabbath day or what day it is, you're in need, I'm here to help. And so he would touch them, he would heal them, he would cure them, he would make them whole because that's what he does. But he would say, look, don't, don't be going around telling anybody about this, which has been something that we often see in the gospel. Jesus is telling everybody to keep it a secret. And so the gospel writer then says that this happened in order to fulfill what was said in the prophet Isaiah, and he quotes chapter 42, which is about Cyrus the Great, but he says, here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not break a bruised weed or quench a smoldering wick. And the writer of the gospel is saying, you know what? Isaiah wrote 700 years ago has an application. And to me, he says, this is fulfilling something Isaiah said. Now, what's interesting is it's only the Gospel of Matthew that makes this connection. The Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John do not make this connection. But part of Matthew's intention was to show the continuity of what Jesus was doing with what was already happening in the Hebrew Bible. So over and over and over again, you see the Gospel of Matthew saying, when Jesus did this or when this happened to Jesus, this was to fulfill what was already said in the Hebrew Bible. Because the writer's intention is to show this connectedness down through the years. But it's only Matthew that makes that connection. So one asks the question, was this to fulfill? What Isaiah said in chapter 42? Or was perhaps Matthew mistaken? Dum, dum, dum. Let me say this. What we do see clearly, and this is in keeping with what I've been talking about for the past few months since we started this narrative lectionary series in September, is one of the brilliant things about the Hebrew Bible is we see how the ancient Israelites are trying to describe how they understood themselves and how they understood their God and how the two of them related to each other. And what's fantastic is we get to read this and we see how they describe themselves and we see what they got right and we also see what they got wrong. How do we know they got some things wrong? Because later on, Jesus is gonna tell them, you got this wrong and you got this wrong about God, so let me tell you this is the way it actually is. 
What we see happening in the whole prophetic tradition in the Hebrew Bible is the prophets trying to hold people to what Yahweh was saying in keeping with the character of Yahweh. Yahweh is a good God. Yahweh cares about you. Yahweh will fight for you. All of these different things. And now when we get to the time of Jesus, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, in seeing and recording, and let's not forget, he wrote this 20 to 40 years after Jesus had said it, when he sees this episode in Jesus' life, he's going, you know what I see in this? I see a connection with what Isaiah wrote in 42. I see in Jesus the character of Yahweh that will not bruise, uh, will not break a bruised reed. I see in the character of Jesus what we see in the character of Yahweh, that he will not extinguish a smoldering wick. Because if Cyrus is the servant of the Lord, well, then Cyrus is exercising things that are in keeping with the character of Yahweh. And this grace and mercy to Israel is what is being seen. It's really Yahweh's grace being shown through Cyrus. And now here we have Jesus doing the same kind of thing to God's own people. And so we see the character of God being linked from the Hebrew Bible through the prophetic tradition into what we see with Jesus. And now in the Christian tradition for the past 2,000 years, we see that character of God continue to be applied to the people of God to the nations around the world. This idea that the God that we seek to worship like we do today is a God who will not break a bruised reed, who will not quench a smoldering wick, a God who is there to restore and bring healing to people, not to be in a hurry to squash them down, but one instead who is saying, there is light in the darkness. There is an opportunity for a new start. There is a reason to hope because I am here to help and build you up and see you grow. And what a wonderful theme to explore on Gaudete Sunday, the Sunday where we indeed rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Why is that important? Emmanuel is a name that means God with us. And what does it mean that God is with us? We have this merciful and great and loving God who has been displaying that character from the beginning, though oftentimes people didn't see it. They saw something else. But we've seen traced through the Hebrew scriptures to Jesus and to today this consistency of the character of God to be one, to bring us to wholeness, to fullness, to peace, to the welfare that we ought to have as ones who are reflecting his character, the character of Jesus, the one it is that we follow. And that is great reason to rejoice. Amen.